Welcome to the Writer Experience Podcast, presented by FlickeringMyth.com. Welcome to the Writer Experience Podcast. Today's guest is Howard Kazanjian. Howard is a film producer whose career spans 50 years. He has collaborated with Hollywood legends such as Alfred Hitchcock, Billy Wilder, Sam Peckinpah, Steven Spielberg, and George Lucas, and worked on such classics as The Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Howard was also vice president of Lucasfilm Limited and is a published nonfiction author. He's also known for producing some of the most commercially and critically successful films of all time and for coming up with the central ideas on many of those films. The new memoir about Howard's life, Howard Kazanjian, A Producer's Life, written by J.W. Rinsler, was just released on September 21st and is in stores now. Howard, as you can see, I've got the props in front of me. Grew up watching many of your films, so it's really exciting to talk to you today. Thank you so much for your time. I know you don't do a ton of these interviews. Thank you for asking me to join you. Our first question is always, where are you in the world right now? I believe you were born in L.A., went to USC, worked in Hollywood. Are you still based in L.A.? Yes, I am. I was born and raised in Pasadena, as was my mother, and we live over in that Pasadena area still. We usually talk about your career trajectory or a writer's career trajectory, but in this case, your book, this memoir about your life, is about your career trajectory. So I would love to focus this episode on your career and would love for those who are maybe listening, aspiring writers, aspiring filmmakers, to get an insight into what it means to be a producer, insight into your life, and maybe get enticed to check out the book as well. I would love to start off with a description. Would you mind if I just, it's basically similar to the bio that I read. Would you mind if I do my worst reading the description of the book? Go ahead. Howard Kazanjian, a film producer whose career spans 50 years, has collaborated with all of the legends such as Alfred Hitchcock, Billy Wilder, Sam Peckinpah, Steven Spielberg, and George Lucas, and worked on such classics as The Empire Strikes Back, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Return of the Jedi, complete with personal anecdotes from the front lines and coupled with rare archival photographs. This full-length biography tells the story of Kazanjian's rise in Hollywood and takes us behind the scenes the producer's role in some of the biggest blockbusters in film history. And I've got a couple quotes. The first one is from you. It's in the beginning of the book. And it is, this book, my memoir, was written not for the ego of it, but as a statement to young potential filmmakers and others about the challenges of our industry, both good and bad. And the other quotes on the back of the book, Mark Hamill. Howard is well prepared. He's smart. He's just what you need to avoid succumbing to the chaos. I'm excited to talk about those challenges you mentioned and the chaos also that Mark Hamill mentioned as well. With that being said, before we dive into it, how are you feeling with the book finally being released? Finally being released, I'm relieved. This is a long time coming. People like Randall Kaiser, who is quoted in the book, for years, for 40 years, has been saying, Howard, you've worked with such talented directors and talented people on interesting projects. You've got to write a book. And others have said the same thing. So over the years, I've taken notes. I've kept call sheets, production reports, scripts, typed up notes, then interviews, kept those interviews. And it's all put together by Rinsler, Jonathan Rinsler, who did an exceptional job. One can write about themselves, but it takes another outside writer to really put it all together and make sense out of all the notes, all the ideas that I had, and the collection of writings that I put together over the years. And that's where Jonathan Rinsler really came through, and I think did a terrific job of the type of book I wanted to write. I know that this was J.W. Rinsler's final posthumous book. You just briefly mentioned the process for it. How does J.W. Rinsler work with you to get that information? out of you. At what point are you involved in the writing and what point has it kind of moved on to him? I turned over hundreds of pages of my notes of interviews that I had done with various institutions and people, a collection of really my history. And he took that and then we sat for one, two actually very long days and he asked questions, took notes, and then several times once he first draft would call back up and say, tell me about this. Should we expound on that, et cetera? And uh, he was the one, again, that called Marsha Lucas, along with Brendan Allinger, who introduced me to Jonathan Rinsler. 
They called Marsha, got the quotes. They called the various people that are quoted in the book. I didn't. I haven't never talked to those people during the book writing process. You actually beat me to my next question, which was about the forward by Marsha Lucas. I have the quote, or one of the quotes from her forward. So I'm happy to contribute to the story of my good friend whose own career, from assistant director trainee working with the likes of Hitchcock and Peckinpah, to his career that coincided with my own at Lucasfilm. It is so interesting. It parallels the history of the movie industry that we both love so much. I hope you enjoy it. And that's from Marsha Lucas, as we mentioned. So how did it feel getting a quote from her to kick off your book? Marsha and my wife and I have been longtime friends going back, going back to the early days, 50 years ago. Prior to any of the films we made together, we've always kept in touch. And I thought, because we didn't get any quotes from George Lucas, why not get a quote from Marsha Lucas? And then she expounded beyond the opening paragraph, which you just read. And Rinsler integrated so much of that throughout the book. And some of it's controversial, as you may have been reading. I would love to kick off into the contents of the book and in your life in general. And I would love to start at the beginning. Obviously, the contents are in the book for the purpose of this podcast. Did you always want to be a filmmaker? I know you went to USC and I know that you met George Lucas back then. So can you walk us through those early days, what was going through your mind and where you thought your career might end up? I always wanted to be in the film business from about the age of 11 when I was handed a wind up eight millimeter, not super eight millimeter camera by my parents. And that started it. And of course, I was an avid movie goer. My parents loved movies. And as mentioned a couple times in the book, my parents would take me to the movies, to the theaters, when I was eight, nine, ten years old. And I just got hooked. This is all I know. This is my life. I love movies, love going to the theater, and I love making them, especially period movies. As I mentioned, you met George Lucas early on. Was it apparent early on from meeting him? I imagine this is before THX 1138. Did you know that he had that talent and that, you know, that entire group, the Dirty Dozen, so to speak, all those filmmakers? Did you realize in the moment that you were part of that kind of movement and the potential that it had? Prior to THX, and the first time I met George Lucas, there was something special about him. He was smart. He was articulate. He was, even then, as I say, thinking out of the box. No, he hadn't even joined the film classes. He was across the street from the USC Cinema Building, taking the normal classes that we all have to take before you start your major. And he was exploring. And that's when we first met. He came over to say, what is this building all about? And we walked him through it. And we talked about it. And we introduced him to a few people and told him about the various classes, whether it be editing or Arthur Knight. I suggested that he take Arthur Knight's class, which he did. And very soon he became a cinema major. Love that. Let's dive into the next step between college and getting to a point where you're producing. I know that originally you were an assistant director. You went through a training program. And I know that the book opens with a letter from producer DGA Joint Training Committee. I believe that was from November 3rd, 1964. Can you walk us through that process and where your head was at that point? Did you want to be a director, I imagine, at the time? And how did those early days happen? As a cinema school student, All of us had dreams of being directors, writers, producers, editors, sound. That's what the USC Cinema was all about. It wasn't just directing. Yes, I wanted to be a director, but that's not why I applied to the assistant director training program. I applied everywhere. I was ringing doorbells as the rest of the students were. I was checking with studios. I was trying to get into the mailroom. I was ringing doorbells at agencies. I was trying to meet as many people as possible and stumbled across the assistant director's training program. I wrote them, and that letter said, we're still in the process of putting it all together. And that was 
many months later that I got a telephone call that said, okay, or a letter that said, come on, now you have to start by filling out an application and taking a test. And if you get that far, you'll be called to an interview, et cetera, et cetera. That was the beginning. That was the first break that I had. And it's in the book because the book is exactly what I want it to be for young filmmakers, the various ways that one can get into the business and the challenges and how long you have to struggle. And you don't reach your goal the first day. It may take 20 years. It may never happen. I hope that's what this book is about. You mentioned the challenges. I believe you were first assistant director on Alfred Hitchcock's Family Plot, second assistant director on Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch, later worked with director Robert Wise on The Hindenburg. Tell us about some of those early challenges before you had become a producer yourself, working on those films and working with very renowned filmmakers. Where to begin? The only person I ever wrote to, director wrote to while I was in school was Robert Wise. So when I had the opportunity to be his assistant director on the Hindenburg, I was thrilled. I was elated. I had reached one of my goals. It was a very difficult picture to make from not only his standpoint, but my standpoint as to laying out the groundwork of when we shoot what, the schedule, the timing, calling in the, the crew and all of that that we go through. And Robert Wise was not the man that I thought he was. He was very hard on me. Many times he'd yell at me in front of the entire crew or cast. And I, I'm one that rationalizes. You know, you come across an actor who has a bad day. Well, he had a fight with his wife or he, his children ran into trouble or he got an accident on the way to work. But I couldn't figure out why Robert Wise was picking on me so much. The answer at the very end, after I left the picture, was that his wife was dying. And I understood. That was one of the challenges. But I'll tell you, putting aside the Star Wars pictures and the Indiana Jones pictures, that was the most difficult picture to coordinate that I've ever worked on. You look at it, you'll say, why? Well, if you're a film buff or a filmmaker, you'd probably figure out why that was the most challenging picture. Hitchcock was the only one that really mentored me. And every single morning we would meet. No one would disturb us. We'd have coffee on fine china. And he'd ask me questions about his films. Now, he also had me screen as many of his films that were available in his private screening room. And then he'd say, Howard, do you know why Kim Novak did this or that? Howard, what color dress was Kim Novak wearing in Ernie's Bar restaurant? And I'd say, green, Mr. Hitchcock. And he'd say, emerald green. Now, that was a lesson right there, emerald green. There was one incident when we were shooting at an old cemetery, and there was a group of mourners standing around the grave. And he walked up to one of the lady extras, and he said, do you know who's being buried and why? And that woman had an answer, an extra. She hadn't read the script. But my job was to let everybody know why they were there and what the situation was. And those are the things he taught me. He would say, do you recall, and he'd mention a movie and a scene. Do you know why I put the camera high up and shot down over their heads? And oftentimes I'd know the answer, but I'd say, no, tell me, Mr. Hitchcock. And he'd explain it. And he explained basically his life, his thinking, his motivation, why he does certain things, why he uses certain lenses at a certain time. And that no one had ever mentored me like he did. And he was a wonderful man, and he treated me well. 
And we had lunch together many, many times in his private dining room, even after we finished the picture. And he was an exception. And I think most people that see any of his films know that he was very unique and a master of filmmaking. There's a photo in the book with a description that says Hitchcock requested that his crew wear suits on set. What is it like wearing a suit when you're trying to make a picture? And then also, is that style, is that eloquence lost to modern filmmaking? Should filmmakers be wearing suits on set? Well, years ago, in the beginning, if I had to go to a meeting at Universal in the Black Tower, as they call it, I had to wear a coat and tie. Years later, I could wear a tie, a loose tie, and maybe the coat over my arm. And then, as administrations changed, you could wear torn Levi's. Not me, but you could wear torn Levi's. Hitchcock and people like Joshua Logan always wore a suit. I don't care where you were shooting, you wore a suit. But Hitchcock requested that I wear a tie, not necessarily a suit, but a coat and matching pants. And there were occasions where he'd say, Howard, does your mother know what tie you're wearing? That's because it wasn't black or dark blue. And there was one time that I just buttoned up the coat a little bit more because I, I didn't have an extra tie to change. And I think he meant that, but at the same time, he was jabbing me. No, he was very conservative. As I said, he always wore a white shirt and a suit, as did Joshua Logan. And back in those days, but back in those days, in the late 70s and 80s, you'd see a cameraman, a DP, wear a tie and dress up. Hitchcock wanted people like Henry Bumstead, who was the production designer, and myself to wear the tie. Or Hilton Green, who was supervising everything from the Black Tower. The executives would always wear a tie if they came to the set. The prop people and lighting people and stuff like that, no. But remember, he's, he's from early England, where they're very proper. Yeah, it's lost. If you uh, asked everyone on set to wear suits now, what would the reaction be? If I was asked? Or if you were to ask your crew? I believe if you want advancement, you should always dress one step above your current position. And that's not true today, but that's my thinking. I would ask, and we have, as have the unions, ask crew members not to wear T-shirts that have something offensive on them. But I think you have to deal with the unions now before you say, hey, wear a tie or look sharp. I mean, times have changed. Times have changed and not only in what we wear, in what the unions can demand. I'd love to talk about your time at Lucasfilm and beyond. You were the vice president of production, and you were intimately involved in the day-to-day -day strategic and practical operations of Lucasfilm during the times immediately after the 1977 release of Star Wars until approximately 1984, 1985. How did you get involved with Lucasfilm in the first place, and where was it at at that point? I imagine Star Wars had just come out. When you walked into Lucasfilm, Describe the world that you walked into. I introduced George to Francis Coppola and spent a lot of time with George and Francis prior to both of them moving to San Francisco. Francis had asked me to be an assistant director on one of his pictures. I couldn't do it because he shot it. The first one, he shot non-union. And I did work on Finian's Rainbow as Francis' as assistant director. And that's where George met Francis. George asked me if I would work with him on THX 1138, the feature film. And I said yes, but I was tied up at Universal on a picture. And then George asked me if I would join him on his space picture, Star Wars. And I said yes, but I was tied up 
on another picture that I couldn't get out of as they were ready to start. And prior to that, George had asked me on American Graffiti. I said yes and couldn't do it. Now, you don't say no to George Lucas, and he keeps asking you to join him. But I was tied up. Some of the films I was working on got delayed, extended, and I had to pass on them. So, again, Gary Kirsch was hired for Star Wars, and Gary asked me even if I would join him. We never asked what was it, you know, is it a co-producer? I was tied up. So George asked me to have lunch with him when the studio asked him to do the sequel to American Graffiti. And I said, yes. And this time was available. That's how I started with Lucasfilm. And I became vice president of Medway Productions, which was a unit shooting more American Graffiti. Later on, I became vice and handled all the day-to-day operations because the only one at Lucasfilm was really George Lucas and Lucy Wilson and a runner. There was no company at that time. There was ILM, but ILM was off shooting Battlestar Galactica. When they rejoined Lucasfilm, I brought them up to San Rafael and got them organized and all of that. Those were the things I was doing. I was negotiating everything for the new Lucasfilm, whether it be unions or crew members, et cetera, et cetera, hiring and letting people go. When the egg company in Los Angeles closed, we picked half of the employees to come with us. The other half, we didn't bring to Northern California. When Empire Strikes Back got into trouble and I took that film over, that's when I became vice president of all, all of the films, not just more American Graffiti. And during that time, we were talking about Radio Land Murders. We were talking about a secret project, which turned out to be Raiders of the Lost Ark. And obviously, we were talking about the sequel to Star Wars. So I physically joined, to answer your question, I physically joined Lucasfilm before Star Wars came out. If you had been involved, obviously, there's a lot of reports of the desert scenes, encountering a lot of weather conditions. What would it have been like if you did get a chance to produce or work on that film? Well, I'm not going to say that there wouldn't have been problems with the weather. I mean, we had weather the first day we were shooting in Buttercup Valley with Return of the Jedi. A huge sandstorm came up. We couldn't shoot. Those are always the challenges, but you have to be able to say, well, what can we shoot? Do we have a cover set? Somebody got ill. What's the next thing we can shoot? Can we replace that particular actor? No, we can't because it's already been established. How can we shoot around that person that didn't show up today? That's where I have been trained. I was trained as a trainee. I knew everything about SAG and meal breaks and penalties and overtime and things like that. The training program was invaluable. And that started me off as an assistant director. I can read a script and almost tell you if it's going to be a set that we're going to build or we're going to shoot on local location, which most people do nowadays. I can tell you from looking at a blueprint of a set that's being constructed on a stage, how many electricians we need on the catwalks. I've been trained to do that. But I've also learned and been trained to read a script and understand that script, that story, what's missing, and be creative with my input. So I don't want to say I'm an all-around guy, but I have to say where I started was a huge asset. Today, you can start off as a director, but you don't know what the other crew members are doing and how they can help you. You haven't been there. You haven't seen it. You don't understand. It's like, you know, you want to go to a doctor, a dentist, or a surgeon that's never operated before, or it's the first operation he's doing, hasn't been schooled. 
And I find that a lot of, I don't want to pick on directors, many, many, many fine directors, but chances are a first-time director who thinks he knows everything more than anyone else is going to stumble down the line. You were just talking about some of the skills that you gained early on. And you also mentioned that on Empire Strikes Back, you were brought on to overcome some of the challenges. What were those challenges and what were the steps that you took immediately to get that picture back on track and see it through? Obviously, it's now regarded as, you know, one of the greatest films ever made, one of the greatest Star Wars movies. Well, not picking on anybody, but Georgia told me when I first came aboard to be in every even though we were preparing more and more graffiti, be in every single meeting that happened regarding Empire Strikes Back, whether it be in Northern California, most of those meetings were in Southern California, and most of them were at Universal, where we were preparing more and more graffiti. There were no other offices. Gary Kurtz would come in occasionally, but Gary was really getting everything ready in England. George said, you're going to be producing the third one, meaning Return of the Jedi. So I want you in every single meeting, which I was. Because of that, I understood what the movie was all about. I broke down the schedule. I did the board for Gary. I did the board for ILM. I didn't tell ILM how to shoot those visual effects shots, but I told ILM which were the visual effects shots and how much of those shots we may be shooting. As an example, Mark Hamill stands in front of a door. He freezes and ILM gets that door closed real fast. But on the stage, it closes slow. So ILM speeds it up. During production, now Lucasfilm is starting to expand. We've hired a president, a vice president, a controller, a head of marketing, a head of the book division, publicity. There were four, five, or six vice presidents. And at the A Company, which was the hub of Lucasfilm in the beginning, we had as many as 75 employees. Well, as the production reports would come in and say, we're one day behind schedule, but on budget, president and vice president were feeling their oats and not sharing that information with anyone. And Gary Kurtz had instructed the accountants not to say anything to the studio, meaning Lucasfilm. And I knew that you can't, that certain things were supposed to be happening in London at the time, and they weren't. And I was being told by the president of Lucasfilm that they're now three days behind, but they're on budget. And I'd say, no, 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 that can't be. And when it got to be $5 million over budget, Gary Kurtz had to tell George Lucas. And that's where the trouble started. Well, the trouble had started earlier, but that's when the curtain came down. And because the film was partially financed by the bank, you had to tell the bank that your $5 million is over. Suddenly, no warning, and it wasn't good. And the bank wanted a new producer, and George suggested me, and the bank said, we've already investigated Howard. We've talked to his past people at Universal, and he would do. And so I basically flew to London for the last two weeks of shooting. Most of that was Yoda. and then totally restructured the budget, restructured ILM. ILM was easy to budget because you have a year to do post-production and you have so many people and it's going to cost X amount of dollars and you're not going to, you're just not going to go over budget. That was the easy part. And then they asked me to report to the bank every day. And I said, "I I can't do that. I'm in London. I, you know, when you're in London and we're making phone calls, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have internet. We didn't have faxes. I'd call at four o'clock in London to speak to ILM or somebody or the Lucasfilm people at 9 a.m. in California. <laughs> it's, it was tough. 
So finally, Charlie Weber took that job and he talked to the bank every day and we came in exactly on the budget that I had predicted. That was the transition when I took over the film and ran it through post-production. Gary Kurtz came in to do some of the timing of the film. I sat with my men and women when we did the 70 millimeter prints, check them all out. You have to run every print to make sure the color is correct and there are no bobbles in the soundtrack because that soundtrack is magnetic striping, not optical. Anyway, we're getting beyond where we are. That's how that story all began. And at that point, or slightly before that, then George made me VP of all production. For both Return of the Jedi and Raiders of the Lost Ark, I've heard that for Raiders, that you campaigned heavily for Harrison Ford to be cast as Indiana Jones. And then for Return of the Jedi, I've heard that you also helped negotiate getting him into that third, or I should say the sixth film. What was your relationship like with Harrison Ford? And what was your involvement getting him, obviously, more screen time? Raiders, or are we talking about Jedi? Which one do you want to start with? You were both. I know you were involved with both. Well, with Raiders, we were looking for, we interviewed really every young actor of that age in Hollywood, trying to find the right person, the right Indiana Jones. Originally, Tom Selleck was the number one choice, but because of Magnum P.I., he had shot the pilot and they were ready to go to Hawaii. He wasn't available. I always saw Harrison Ford in the role. And I kept saying to Stephen and George, Harrison Ford, Harrison Ford, Harrison Ford. But George rarely uses the same actor again. He will if it's a sequel or prequel. But he doesn't tend to use the same actor. And without getting into detail, (laughs) finally, George and Stephen agreed that Harrison Ford should be Indiana Jones. And they needed to agree. Because time had run out. We were building sets. We had built sets. We had costumes going. Special effects was all lined up, and we didn't have a leading man. Also, Stephen Stephen didn't sign on until almost the last minute, too. I mean, he got his 10 weeks of preparation. But Stephen is so busy with so many projects, you never know which one he's going to do next. He's lucky. Stephen is a brilliant director, too. Stephen, and I've said this in the book, I think, and I've said it many times, Stephen is one that can walk into a set that he has never seen before other than he knows what it's going to basically look like and know exactly where he wants to put the camera and how he's going to direct his actors. The opposite is with Sam Peckinpah, which every single day will take two hours literally two hours, trying to figure out how he's going to shoot this particular scene. What about for Return of the Jedi, getting him involved there? Because I know his contract originally didn't include him being in Return of the Jedi. That's correct. He didn't have a contract to do Return of the Jedi, and he didn't want to do Return of the Jedi. And during the time where we were talking about the script and what was going to be in it, and you know, who's returning and who are any of the new characters. I said to George one day, what about Harrison Ford? Why isn't he in it? He said, well, he really didn't want to do it. We, Whatever, the contract and all of that. And I said, well, what if I can bring him back? Now, remember, I had pushed him for Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I had worked with him. Nothing special. We would talk and. You know, we weren't buddies or anything, but he was there and I liked him. And I said, why isn't he in the next episode? And George says, if you can get him, we'll bring him back. Well, I called him. (laughs) He agreed. And George said, "Okay, we're going to write the script where we unfreeze him. And that's where that all part came from. Now, we didn't have a script at that time. This was all done before we started writing. It's also true. With Larry Kasdan, we were looking for a writer. George didn't want to write Return of the Jedi. And I said, well, what about Larry Kasdan, who 
we brought in on Empire Strikes Back. And that's another story on how he was brought in. And of course, he had done Raiders. And George says, you'll never get him. He's now a writer, director of his own films. And I said, well, why don't we ask? George said, ask. And he said, yes. Now, most of the time, you ask those type of questions and you get a no, or you never get an answer. But Larry Kasdan and Harrison Ford came back right away and said, yes. So you negotiate their deal and you get going. Ups and downs, those are the challenges. And you look back and say, you know, so we succeeded or we didn't succeed. And it took a lot of time or we lost time. And it's a learning project. But if you don't try, you're not going to get an answer. You had a lot of input on the set of Return of the Jedi, also Raiders of the Lost Ark. I know that you had input, for instance, on the scene with the headpiece, the staff of Ra, and for Return of the Jedi, you also had a role in suggesting to show the Force ghosts of Obi-Wan Kenobi and Yoda. And then I believe you suggested adding Anakin Skywalker as well. Walk us through the role of a producer on set and their ability to add these small, nuanced details that might not seem like a big deal in the moment, but end up being iconic moments in a film. Yeah, well, obviously, you don't want to suggest something that's going to cause chaos or going back and reshooting or having to add a new set or new characters or something like that. It's great to make those suggestions during the development stage. And on Jedi, we went through a number of drafts with two different writers. George Lucas wrote the first draft. At the same time, Larry Kasdan was writing a draft. Then they came together. We're getting off the subject a little bit, I know. They came together. We discussed their drafts. They went back out, did another run on their drafts. And they came back. And they were all very, very close. And then George did the final polish. During that time, you can make suggestions. You can throw out a set. You can add a set. You can add people. But during production, because you do have a budget and you do have cast members that have commitments elsewhere after so many days, you can make those little suggestions. Why isn't Darth Vader there with Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi? Why can't you do this? Why can't oh, we need a retake? I don't see in dailies that such and such happened. Let's go back with the second unit tomorrow and get those shots. You can make those suggestions. We make those suggestions. That's what we do. But at the same time, once you're in production, the producer's role changes a little bit. And that's to keep everything going day by day per the schedule that you've laid out months ago. And by keeping on schedule, you basically were keeping on budget. And that's very, very important. Howard, I have a few bonus questions that we call a series of seemingly random questions. The first one, obviously, this is a writing podcast, and you've worked with a lot of writers. You just mentioned Lawrence Kasdan. From your experience, what are the consistent qualities of the successful writers you've worked with In your experience, what are those qualities that you'd like to suggest to the writers who are listening that might help them succeed in their careers? The most important thing that I see in a writer is story, story, story. And unfortunately, I see too many movies and television shows today where you sit through it and you say, well, what's the story? That is the most important thing for me in picking a writer. You know, sadly today, A lot of people feel that if a writer is 40 years old, he no longer knows anything and he can't write decent screenplays anymore. And it's just the opposite. I find that it's rare that you find a first-time writer or a very young writer that understands story and characters and dialogue. And those are the things that are most important for me. Story, dialogue characters. And if you don't have characters and they can't talk, then you don't have characters. And if you don't have story, you don't have anything. Look at writers' past performances, past screenplays, whether it be comedy or action, 
dramas, whatever. That's what you have to look for and how they match whatever it is that you're now doing. I mean, Ernie Lehman, old time famous, you know, North by Northwest and on it. Actually, Hitchcock's last picture as well. Can he write, if I was doing a Western today? Yeah, he was so good, he probably could. Could he do a comedy? I don't know. So it's casting. It's casting like you're casting a director and you're casting a cast. You're casting a writer. Your quote, the book, my memoir, was written not for the ego of it, but as a statement to young potential filmmakers and others about the challenges of our industry, both good and bad. What are some words of wisdom you would give to those aspiring writers who might be listening right now who are looking to get their foot in the door now? Obviously, times have changed a lot since you got your start. So for those listening, what are some things you would say to help them stay inspired and maybe get to that next level? Well, first, you have to have passion. And then I think most important, you have to have a dream. Then you have to have a goal. And then you have to sit down and start writing and writing again. And if you're rejected, you write another script. And you have to keep writing. And then once you have something that you think or others think are decent, now it's all contact. Who can you get that property to? And as most writers know, you almost have to have an agent. And how do you get an agent? Writers so often, young writers so often say, Howard, I want to get an agent. Challenge is you can suggest an agent and the agent says, well, what has he written? What has he sold? Well, he hasn't sold anything yet. Well, I can't take him on because I've got other clients. It's that old story. But oftentimes, a writer can get directly to a producer, and the producer may like that screenplay, and, and then the rest is history. That's the challenge. I don't know the answer. There is an answer. It happens. Writers get agents. How do they? Different ways. Who do they know? Who can read their screenplay and get it to an agent? But don't give up. Keep writing. You get rejected. Your screenplay gets thrown out. Write another story. But learn how to do it. Again, the most important thing for me when I read a story is story. What is a story? Where are we going with it? I read a scene and I say, does this move the story forward? No. Why? Well, can we rewrite this scene? It's tough nowadays for young writers, I think. You know, you can take, and it happens with me too, I can take a script that I think is pretty well finished and take it to a studio, and a studio executive will say, well, I didn't like this one scene. And they pass on the project. In the past, they say, we didn't care for this one scene. What if we took it out, or what if we changed it, or what if we took it off of a train and put it on a plane? That was the past. Now you have to go in, not only with the screen, not, well, let's see, us people that have been in the business a while have to go in with your screenplay and a director and maybe the cast or one member of the cast. Or if you don't have the director, you have to go in with a big cast member. And then the studio executive says, oh, now I visualize it. It's tough out there for writers, especially, and producers. These days, streaming and serialized TV is very popular. From a producing perspective, how has that changed? How is it different to produce a story, like you just mentioned, that's set across multiple episodes, an arc that it's a little bit more than, let's say, a two-hour film. It's a 10-, one-hour film, so to speak. Well, not only is it 10 one-hour films, I took something to a studio recently, and they said, and it was a one-hour film, and they said, can I, for streaming, can I cut it down to five or seven minute segments? Couldn't do it. That kind of streaming, I don't, I just think is a bad and not going to exist. I can't do that. I can't take my story and cut it up and make little stories out of it. As far as streaming at home, whether it's a one hour or a two hour show or five hour show, I think that's here and I think that will stay. I think a lot of people like staying and having their own theater at home. I'd rather go to the theater. Do I love streaming? 
Do I stream myself? Very little. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for me in short segments, the people are watching on their iPhones. I don't understand that. And I don't understand if, if you're doing two or three or four episodes, one hour episodes, how somebody can watch a half hour of it, of episode four, and then turn off their TV and then come back and watch a half hour of episode six. I don't get that. And that's maybe because I'm too old and set in the old fashioned ways. I've got a couple more bonus questions. You can choose not to answer this one if you want, but I'm going to throw it out there. On the back of the book, as I mentioned, we've got a quote from Mark Hamill. Howard is well-prepared. He's smart. He's just what you need to avoid succumbing to the chaos. That's from Mark Hamill. Is there one particular moment, one story about working with Mark Hamill, a fond memory or a good experience from your time working on the Star Wars films? With Mark, no. Mark Hamill is a very talented person, works very, very hard, is extremely articulate, on the set, off the set, is very knowledgeable about a lot of things. But when it comes to Jedi or Empire or any of those films, I believe that the Star Wars franchise is about Luke Skywalker. And Luke Skywalker is Mark Hamill. And not only has Mark Hamill been a great Luke Skywalker, he has carried that image away from the screen in his everyday life. And while we're in production, he gives so much that he's exhausted at the end of the day. I mean, you're lucky, you know, there were times where I'd go to dinner with him a couple times. Couldn't even talk. He was so tired because he gives his all and he understands what he has to do. And if the director wants something of him and he thinks it's not quite right, he'll speak up. And, you know, all that sword fighting and stuff, laser fighting, it's tough on a body. I have everything good to say about Mark Hamill, and there's nothing that that was a wonderful day or a terrible day. It was all a good day. And I'm so glad that I'm a friend of Mark's today. Talented man. Talented man. I'm sorry that he wasn't in some of the episodes that we've seen recently. I think, I don't want to get into it. I think it's just a mistake that the new filmmakers don't understand, as I believe that Luke Skywalker is the story. A Jedi Knight is the story. And for him to have thrown the sword or the lightsaber over his head, I mean, I just, I just didn't understand that. Those uh, are hard films to make. I give those filmmakers, whether you like any particular film, credit. You know, I've always said for many, many years, when I read a critic who blasts the film, I've always said a critic shouldn't be a critic until they make their own film. They're hard to make. And sometimes the best laid plans don't go well. You could have a great script. Well, you could have a great script and not a great film. Usually that's rare. Somebody is screwed up somewhere. My last question in regards to Star Wars. Star Wars, obviously, of the works you've worked on, I'm sure you get a lot of questions about it. It's become a phenomenon owned by Disney now. It's a huge thing. There are podcasts about it. There's a lot of news about it. Is there anything at this point that the people of the world don't know about the making of Star Wars? No, it's a lot of work. A lot of love goes into them. As you said, Mark said, chaos. I mean, things can be crazy. Schedules and timing and accidents and things not ready. And that's true with any film. You need, as a producer, maybe the chaos that you're talking about or he's talking about is you keep everything quiet and low. From what goes on in the stick, you don't have screaming and yelling and People saying, roll it, keep it low, keep it quiet. If something goes wrong, be there and have an answer, calm everybody. And it's whoever the boss is, whether it's the director, well, you have several bosses, the director, the producers, etc. It's the image. It's how you handle yourself. It's how you speak to people. You know, in, in London, when you're shooting in London, that crew member that's painting something way out in the back lot, 
wants to know who the director is and wants the producer to walk through the studios, if not every day, every other day, and say, oh, that looks good. What are you making there? That was my job while in London. And it's true here, too. You have a team working with you. And that team has to believe in you and has to know they're part of the team. And if they don't know that, maybe there is chaos. I don't have the answer. I just know what I have to do as a producer. Last two questions, and this one might be a tough one. Obviously, you've worked with a ton of very acclaimed filmmakers. We always ask the question, if you could take any writer, living or dead, to any fast food restaurant, which writer would you choose, which restaurant, and why? I might take Ernie Lehman because of his past record. And I didn't know the man. Never. Well, I have seen the man a couple times when he was in meetings with Hitchcock. But he is one of the great writers of the past. You know, Lincoln Lemison, who did the Hindenburg. I went to lunch with them several times. Peck and Paul, who wrote The Wild Bunch. I'd love to go to lunch with him because he's a different man. You know, he's not that guy on the set that's driving everybody crazy. But I don't know that I'd chance it. That's a tough question. You know, Larry Kasdan. I'll tell you who I'd like to go to lunch with and have gone to lunch many times because it's really educational is George Lucas. We not only talk about what we're doing, we're talking about the ranch. We're talking about the direction he's going to go. We're talking about, well, if I went today, we would be talking about his museum. We would talk about his retirement. We'd talk about his accomplishments. And I, I tell him his accomplishments, you know, whether it be THX, ILM, fast editing, less dialogue, great music. Johnny Williams is not a writer, he's a composer. I'd like to go to lunch with him. I would go with George and I tell George, the great things that he's accomplished in life. He may know it, but it's probably not laid out in front of him. Talented man, inventor. He's put his money where his mouth is. Where would you take him to lunch? A hamburger place. <laughs> George, I'd take to a hamburger place. Ernie Lehman, I'd probably have to take to a fancy restaurant. Love that. The last question, this is another one that we ask every guest, is, if you could choose one learning or insight from your entire career that you'd like to pass along to those writers who are listening, what is the one thing from your entire career that you'd like to pass along? Have a goal, have a dream, reach your goal, but be honest throughout your entire career. Don't step on other people to move up the ladder. If you're really good at what you do, somebody will recognize you and help you move up the ladder. Now, that's not saying that there are very talented people that can't get anywhere. At the same time, there are people with no talent that get places in our industry, and I think you know that. But you do have to have a dream. It starts with a dream. It starts with a goal. And it's work hard. Be honest about it. And that's what I tell any student that I ever speak with or meet with. When I say student, young person that wants to get in the business. Well, thank you, Howard. It's been a pleasure. As I mentioned earlier, these are my actual VHS copies, Raiders, Return, Empire Strikes Back. I guess a bonus question before we wrap up would be, when you make these films, or at the time, did you realize, did you think about the impact that it would have on aspiring filmmakers, generations that grow up on it? people that are still watching, younger generations that are still watching these films and they're still changing their lives. Is that going through your mind when you're on the set and you're tired and it's a long day? Yeah, with the Star Wars pictures, again, I joined them after the first Star Wars. Yes, you think about that. You think about the next generations. And it's true. The Star Wars pictures are intergenerational. Fathers, grandfathers, kids, they all love Star Wars. With Raiders of the Lost Ark, I knew it'd be successful. And I know at that time, George said there would be three. The second one he said would be darker, which it was. He just said it was going to be darker. There was no idea at the time. I felt that it would be successful, never as successful as it really was. And, you know, if you have a 
spinoff, if you have a TV series from it, which he did, if you have a, a sequel, great. But you're working on the first one, and that's the one that must be successful and work. Otherwise, you've lost everything. Well, thank you, Howard. The most important question is, did you have fun today talking to us about your career, your life? You know, if you and I met on the street or we're having lunch, I would never bring up my career. When my wife and I go places, I always elbow her. I don't want to talk about myself. It's tough, and I don't want to talk about the films. And sometimes everybody will talk about what they do, and I just pray that nobody asks me what I do. I don't know why that is. I don't know why that is. So it's hard for me to talk about it, and it was hard for me to write a book. And thank God for Jonathan, who put it all together from my notes. And I only did that because I was told early on in my career Howard, you've worked with such interesting people. You've got to write a book. You've got to write a book. So I've kept all those notes over the years and scripts and call sheets and interviews. I'll show the book again for the video side of the podcast. The new memoir about Howard's life, Howard Kazanjan, A Producer's Life, written by J.W. Rinsler, was just released on September 21st and is in stores now. Howard, did you want to plug anything at all before you go? It could be anything, projects you're working on, social media, anything at all, even the book itself. Uh, Nothing to plug because I have nothing coming out right now. I have one book that was just recently optioned, a Western called Thunder Over the Prairie. It's about Dodge City. It was optioned by a company. I tried to get it off the ground for a number of years. Walter Hill wanted to direct it. I have another project based on a book that we wrote called Playing for Time, or the screenplay is a different title. And that one, an Australian group wants to shoot, wants to finance. So we're working on that. That's a prison baseball, historic, true story that we would shoot probably in Arizona. And then there's a group of Australians who want me to produce two films of theirs in Australia that we've been talking about and just about to do a polish on those two screenplays. You know, you're always preparing something and you have to. You might have to prepare have four or five or six or seven projects that you're working on. Hopefully one will go. Love that. And shout out to Chris Enns, who we've had on the podcast, thanks to you, who's your, would you say, writing partner? Chris is terrific. And Chris does most of the work. I have to give her credit for the 10 or 11 or 12 books that we've written. And we have a new one coming out in November and another one, not a Western, on Margaret Dumont next year. Thank you for the recommendation for her. Thank you for stopping by and taking the time with us. Last shout out, Howard Kazanjian, Producer's Life. If you are listening, watching, please go check it out. Buy it hear about Howard's experience. I really appreciate you, Howard, and taking the time. I know you don't do a lot of interviews, so thank you so much. It really, really does mean a lot. Thank you, Court. Thank you. And thanks to our listeners. We hope to see you next week. Thank you so much for listening to The Writer Experience. If you enjoyed the episode today, please leave a rating, a review, and a comment on iTunes. You can also check us out on Instagram at Writer Experience and Twitter and Facebook at Writer EXP. The Writer Experience is a Samurai Dinosaur production. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved. Music by Kevin McLeod.